So I'm going to get started. Uh, welcome to our third uh, webinar. This session is going to be called uh, and referring to value stream mapping. And a lot of people are familiar with value stream mapping as it applies to um, large organizations. We're going to look at it from a perspective from for small to medium-sized shops, particularly shops that have high mix uh, and low volume, and it's been a little bit of a, more of a challenge for those companies to incorporate some of these uh, techniques that are applied at uh, companies, say, like an automotive uh, manufacturer that produces uh, one type of product, maybe in, in a variety of models. Um, we are going to stop from time to time, and I'll take some uh, questions off the chat. Uh, if you have trouble hearing uh, the phone number there, you can call in using your your phone, and uh, you'll have to enter the conference ID number, which is also on the screen there. So I'll just leave that on there for a few more seconds. And uh, again, we have people monitoring, monitoring the chat. If you have a question, we'll try to stop from time to time and get an answer for you. Uh, but let's get started on this subject. Um, there are many steps in transforming a company or a value stream uh, using the lean manufacturing uh, techniques, whether you're in an administrative process or a manufacturing process. Uh, we're going to be focusing on one this, this afternoon, uh, simply the step of that mapping the value stream map. Uh, we have, we've already talked about 5S and setup reduction, and future webinars will probably cover some of these other tools, but we're going to zero in on mapping the value stream map today. Uh, there's a really terrific book uh, called Learning to See, and I can't really improve on this if what you do is the same thing every day, uh, but most of my clients uh, tend to have a higher mix and, and a lower volume, uh, and it, it's a little more difficult to apply these same techniques. So we're going to uh, recommend this book for those companies that uh, do the same thing every day, and we're going to introduce you to some new tools and techniques for those uh, that don't do the same thing every day. Value stream mapping is much like road mapping. There's a lot of information on a value stream map, and if I were to throw this uh, road map in front of my nine-year-old grandson, it could be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, we don't want to have people be overwhelmed by value stream mapping, but there is a lot of information on a value stream map, but you're looking at it at different times for different reasons, and so you kind of tune out everything that's kind of busy about the value stream map, much like you do with a road map if you identify that there, there are some uh, interstate highway symbols and, and somebody asks you to find interstate highway 405, you kind of tune out the busyness uh, about the other things that are on the map. And same with high stream mapping. If you identify that uh, the triangle represents inventory uh, and you're looking for a particular area of inventory between two processes, you kind of tune out the busyness going on with the, the rest of the value stream map. So we do look at value stream maps at different times for different reasons. Um, one of the key indicators on a value stream map is something we call the value added ratio. This may be a new term uh, for many of you listening in, but a, a ratio is expressed in mathematics as uh, 1 to 10 or 1 to 100. So if I have 1 parts of water to, to 10 parts of uh, sugar, for example, in a recipe, um, then that is the ratio. And the ratio we're going to be talking about is the value-added ratio. So what percentage of the time do you spend working on a product or a service versus the time a patient waits or a product waits or a customer waits? And I would say that in my experience of working with 170 or so uh, different companies, the value-added ratio in most manufacturing firms I've visited uh, are around uh, 1 to 300 or 1 to 350, which means for every minute they actually work on something, it sits around on a pallet or on a rack or on somebody's inbox for 300 to 350 minutes. So uh, world-class companies are focusing in on the lowest value-added ratio they can achieve, and that means extracting all of the non-value-added motion, obviously. So we're going to talk about all the forms of waste uh, as we go through this presentation. So think about that value-added ratio as we show you some of these value stream maps. Value stream maps can contain uh, many, many uh, different uh, symbols, uh, and you can actually get little patches uh, to be able to use with Visio or Excel, and you can actually clip and paste these right in to, the, uh, to your value stream map. I think uh, it's not so important which symbols you use necessarily as that everybody on, on your team understands what the symbols are telling them. So you may even uh, end up using some of your own, making up your own symbols, but these are some of the symbols you'll typically see on a value stream map. 
And what we're really trying to do by mapping the value stream map is to try to find the shortest distance uh, and eliminate as much of the wasted motion as we possibly can. So there's a mantra in a lot of the uh, world-class companies that say, if you pick it up, finish it. And in most companies, that's not the case. They pick it up and they set it down and they pick it up and they set it down many times. And often they add other steps like storing it and counting it and inventorying it and pulling it back out of inventory. And we want to get rid of all that non-value-added activity and get to the straight line. So one of my favorite books is a, is a book called The New Manufacturing Challenge uh, by Zuzaki, and he has a very nice graphic that shows the difference between the typical uh, traditional batch uh, methodology versus the flow. And he uh, uses, like uh, Taichi Ono did it, the Toyota Motor Works, the, the mental image of a, of a rocky, uh, a bunch of rocks under some water that, that interrupt the flow. And so we want to remove the rocks or there are symbolic of problems, and that way our inventory can flow uninterruptedly. And another version of this, uh, which I appreciated, uh, I think it comes from Taichi Ono, is he was very disciplined about lowering the inventory, which is symbolic of water here, which are hiding problems. As we lower that inventory, uh, the rocks are exposed, the problems are exposed, and it's up to us to be disciplined about removing the problems. Otherwise, the only choice is to raise the inventory and cover up or hide the problems again, and that's not going to get us very far toward our goal of being world class. So um, when we talk about value added uh, versus non-value added, just a quick reminder, value added is something the customer is willing to pay for. It physically transforms the product, and it's always done right the first time. Non-value added is the diametric opposite of that. It consumes resources, but it doesn't add anything of value from the customer's perspective. Um, there are a couple of categories in the non-value added uh, field there. It's, there's, there's necessary non-value added things that might be required by the government, uh, maybe because of a quality system that you have in place or company policy. Uh, those are necessary, but they still add no value. Unnecessary is the worst of all, and that's the things that we're uh, trying to eliminate as soon as possible. When you look at all the business activities, when you look at all the business activities, thank you very much, Adam. <laughs> when we look at all the things that go on in, a, in an organization, there's, there's usually a high degree of focus on the operations out in the shop. But there's many, many other operations in your value stream that oftentimes material or information or data are, are getting passed back and forth, and it creates a convoluted flow. And our goal in value stream mapping is trying to identify those backflows and eliminate the stops and starts. So we use a methodology, uh, most people are familiar with this term Kaizen or change for the better. Uh, we use this Kaizen methodology and we're just going to show you some actual case studies of companies that have done this. So first step is identify where you're at. So drive the stake in the ground, identify what your on-time delivery performance is, uh, require it requires 12 days to produce produce each order in this case uh, there's only 12 minutes of labor so the value added <coughs> ratio is high uh, so there's the target rich environment in this case their value added ratio is 1 to 480 so for every minute they're adding value for 480 minutes it's not having any value added uh, their current inventory is uh, over half a million the current defects per million or their quality rating is uh, 24,000 defects for every million opportunities to make a defect. So that has to do with some Six Sigma techniques. Uh, and in our quality mapping, uh, we roll that right into value stream mapping, which we'll show you. Uh, the distance traveled is important. How many setups are uh, used to get a product to market is something we often measure. This current condition statement gets turned into a, an objective statement, which always starts with the same three words, we intend to. So we intend to reduce lead time by X, inventory by X, uh, improve our value added ratio to less than something uh, reasonable. It's uh, in this case, uh, one to 50 is not an unreasonable target. Uh, improve our defects per million to less than 2,000 instead of the 2,500 or whatever it was before. Reduce dis distance traveled and, and uh, our setup time. So you gotta have some metrics that you can go back to and. Uh, measure yourself against to see if you've actually had an improvement, and that's the 
the whole idea behind developing a current condition statement and an objective statement. So I'm going to give you an example, and this is a high level, obviously hard to see. Uh, it's uh, got some proprietary information on it, so I, I've kind of got it down to where it's uh, a little bit hard to interpret. But this particular company made jet engine diffusers in the investment casting business, and you can see all the steps and all the triangles. Uh, each triangle might have held one, two, three, twelve pieces of inventory there, and each of these jet engine diffusers was worth about $5,600 a piece. Well, if they had 114 in their work in process hose, you might say, if you think about a garden hose, and each, uh, each product going in is like a marble, uh, their garden hose was 114 marbles long. And if you're the customer, uh, an airline waiting for a jet engine diffuser to be delivered, it would take 456 hours to make it through the garden hose or through their process because of all the stops and starts, which translates uh, to about 57 day lead time. Now, we streamlined the process, took out a lot of the inventory. Now they only have 19 pieces of whip. Uh, still, they're, they're worth $5,600, but when they pick it up, they might do 10 or 12 things to it before they set it back down. So now their lead time is 76 hours or about nine and a half days. I don't know what it would cost per day to have a, an aircraft sitting on a tarmac waiting for a jet engine diffuser. But my guess, if it, if it was there for 57 days, that would be a significant amount of money. So having a nine-day lead time puts these, this company almost in a, uh, you know, an untouchable uh, situation. There, it'd be hard to compete with somebody that was that much quicker at uh, manufacturing product than, than you were at 57 days. So how did they get there is the question we're going to answer for you throughout this uh, little, little uh, webinar. Now, this is another company, and I'm just going to tell you there's only four slides here, but this is kind of a pictorial representation of their value stream map. The material took six days to get through their process. It came from the warehouse to a resaw and where they split it, and they were making lineal molding that might go around your window or door casing. Uh, after they split it on the resaw, it went into a warehouse. It might sat there for a day or two, and then it went to a molder where they profiled it, and then it went to a warehouse again, and finally to a paint line, and then into another warehouse before it was loaded on the truck. So it was four, uh, or I'm sorry, six days of process time and wait time, 10 forklift driver movements, and their value stream map for this process looked like this. So. It went from the resaw to the molder to the prime to the primer paint line, and in between each of these steps was a an inventory queue, which translated to 48 hours or two days. So a six-day lead time overall took about eight and a third people to run this uh, little manufacturing system, and their value-added ratio, if you'll notice over here on the right-hand side, is one to 311. We put together a little manufacturing cell using this value stream mapping. Uh, both the current state here and the future state, which we'll show you in a minute. And now the material comes to a resaw, which goes directly into a molder, which goes directly into a paint line, and is directly put into a box uh, after it's painted. And the process time really takes one minute and 27 seconds. Uh, they still call it a half a day lead time, uh, but it takes six people instead of eight and a third it freed up $50,000 worth of inventory, which basically paid for the construction of this little uh, manufacturing cell, and it was a 96% improvement in lead time. You can see that in their value-added ratio. Instead of a 1 to 300, it's now 1 to 12, which is approaching world-class status. So how did they arrive at that, uh, at that answer, that future state? Well, they used a uh, methodology we'll start talking about here called tack time. And it's real easy to calculate a tack time if you're Henry Ford and you only have one product type. Uh, it's a simple formula. It's simply available time divided by demand. And so if you look at the formula this way, available time divided by demand equals tack time. In Henry Ford's case, if you had an eight-hour day, 480 minutes divided by the, the need to produce 120 cars, 480 divided by 120 means you need to produce a car every four minutes. Now that makes perfect sense if you're making one car after another all day and they're all the same. But in most of the clients that we work with, 
they don't make the same thing every day. They don't make one car after another, maybe just as simply a different model. Uh, they might make, one day they might make dishwashers. Uh, the next day they might make birthing beds. The next day they might make vending machines. So how do you calculate what the tack time is on when there's different uh, levels of complexity in the products that you produce? Because a birthing bed for the hospital uh, might only be equal to, a, let's say, call it a common denominator of one unit of work, but a dishwasher might be three units of work, and a vending machine might be seven units of work. So now how do you calculate your tack time uh, in that situation? So I'm going to give you a real-life example, then we're going to stop and take a few questions. This is a company up in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and they make oil pipeline equipment. This is just one product line they make. It, this is, probably represents 15% of their business. And you can see that even within this product family called uh, wellhead casings, there's a, different, there's a variety of work. Some have one flange, some have two flanges, and some have multiple flanges. And so when I went to visit them, they said, we've tried the application of tack time. It doesn't work in our industry because our products are not all the same. This particular product at the bottom here uh, it takes a lot more effort than a one, one flange unit. And I asked them, you know, to just give me some anecdotal data. What, what is, what is the, the difference in labor content? And they said, well, the one at the bottom isn't three times as hard uh, just because it has three flanges, but it's probably a little over two times as hard. And the one in the middle uh, isn't twice as hard just because it has twice as many flanges, but it's a little over one and a half times as difficult. So in the past, they, had, they knew how many of these they produced. They produced 7,000 a year. And in a year, you have 120,000 minutes of available time. So the tack time formula of available time divided by demand seems to indicate that 120,000 divided by 7,000, they need to produce a unit every 17 minutes. But when they got a bunch of these three flange units, it, they were always behind. And when they got a bunch of the one flange unit, they were always overproducing. So the tack time methodology didn't seem to ring true in their case. So we asked them uh, again, okay, you're producing 7,000 units. How many of each of these will you produce? And they broke it down this way. They said, well, we pr we'll probably produce 2,000 like this and 2,500 like these two here. And I said, well, if you multiply 2,000 times one, and if you multiply 2,500 by 1 1.6, it will give you the number of work units that you're producing instead of the number of units you're shipping because you're shipping 7,000 units. But how many units of work does that represent if you do the math? And it ends up being 11,250 units of work. So I really don't care how many pieces they ship. I care how many units of work they ship. So if you assume the same 120,000 minutes of available time in a year and divide that by the 11,000 units of work, their tack time is not 17 minutes. Their tack time is a little over 10 and a half minutes. And when I make one of these three flange variety wellhead casings, I'm going to get two credits or a little over two credits for that. And on my hour by hour chart, I'd, I'd be able to identify that I've, uh, I've made two tack times worth of work. So let's uh, take a very simple example and identify how you would develop a value stream map for something that has uh, different levels of complexity. And the fact is that not all the product flows the same way because in a Henry Ford's plant, every car gets a set of tires, every car gets a windshield, every car gets an engine. But in some cases, in, in this little simple uh, sample here, and by the way, uh, NBIE will provide everybody that wants a copy, uh, uh, a copy of this value stream map so you can play with it. Uh, but let's say that there's a, a process where we're a cabinet shop and we're making cabinets for residential homes, uh, kitchen cabinets and bathroom cabinets, and some of the product we make uh, goes through an NC saw and it ships right out. Some of it goes through the saw and goes through an NC router. So that's about 20% of what we do. And then some of the product goes from the NC saw through the router and into assembly. 
which represents 22%. So the total of this is obviously 100%. We're going to use that as what we call our PQR analysis, our product quantity routing analysis. And we're going to put that into a, a little spreadsheet that says, okay, here's the, the NC saw. The NC saw in terms of complexity is only about a one. It's pretty straightforward. The router is a little more complex and the assembly is way more complex in terms of the labor content. But even inside of this assembly process, there's different levels of complexity. There's simple to assemble and moderate to assemble complex and, and then prototype might be the, the most complex even within that group. We're going to take a look at the, the simplest first. We're going to Early on your value stream mapping process, you've got to determine whether or not you want, to, you want to give attention to the complexity or whether you want to call everything a common denominator and just time that common denominator and multiply it by the complexity. Uh, and I know that sounds complicated, but we're going to simplify it here for you visually in a minute. Uh, let's just say that based on our current sales, uh, the material that's going to go through the NC saw cut, uh, we need 60 of them. 60 pieces and 40 of those pieces are going to get routed and 16 of those pieces are going to get assembled and those 16 pieces come from this list right here seven easy to assemble five moderate three complex and one prototype that total daily demand of pieces out the door is 116 so based on a 480 minute day uh, divided by the demand that means my tack time is four minutes this is, this is the tack time we're going to use as I show you our value stream map, but I want to show you what happens if you do want to give uh, regard to the complexity factor and see how much this daily demand would, would change, kind of like those folks making the, the oil pipeline equipment. Uh, some of the product was more complex, and they wanted to have a daily work unit rather than a daily pieces shipped. So in this case, if I multiply the seven times the one, I get, of course, seven units of work, but five pieces multiplied by two gives me 10 units of work. So if I back up, I didn't give that any attention here, but I am going to give it attention here. I'm doing the multiplication. So you'll notice the 16, the 16 pieces shipped here becomes 30 units of work based on these this multiplication. So my tack time is dropping down. I need things faster because the daily demand has changed. It's changed from 116 pieces shipped to 230 units of work. Uh, so that's a little more complex than I wanted to get into today, but I wanted to at least show you how you have to attribute the complexity of the parts you make into units of work uh, if if all the parts are not the same like a car going down an assembly line. But we're going to go ahead and use this simple, more simplified version to show you the value stream map. And so keep this one in mind, our tack time being four minutes and change. So we go out and we actually time every process. Now this is the, the numerically controlled saw. And based on our current demand, we know that 51% of the parts are just going to saw cut. And those are simple. So that's two minutes of unit per work. And for the saw, it doesn't matter that later it's going to go to the router, but we're going to still break out the percentage that will go from the saw to the router. It's also two minutes of work, but the parts that are assembled evidently are a little more complicated to saw. So 13.8% of the parts that saw will also assemble, and that will take two and a half minutes of work. So my weighted average, which is simply two minutes times 51% and two minutes times 34% and two and a half minutes times 13.8% and add it all together. You don't have to do this math. We got a spreadsheet that does it for you is 2.1 minutes worth of work. There's also some machine cycle time uh, where the operator can walk away and the machine runs itself. There's also some setup time. And based on those same percentages, we're going to allow about two tenths of a minute uh, for every unit that comes off this saw. Um, there's also a yield, which we'll talk about later. And 100%, 100% this is a very important one, 100% of all the product that goes through this plant goes through the saw. This will change on the NC router and in the assembly department. 
We also capture the distance traveled there at the bottom so we can develop a spaghetti diagram. Okay, so the next step is they pass on to the NC router, and now 71% of these will route, and that's it. That takes six minutes. But 28.6% will route and then go to assembly, and those take seven minutes. So again, the weighted average. Only 48% of these total will actually go through this process, but this number has to add up to 100% because this is when it comes this way, what percentage of them are of this variety. So then it goes to the assembly where there's a lot of variety. There's four types of product. They're simple, moderate, complex, and prototype, and here's the percentages coming straight across from the, the, the what we call the PQR analysis, the product quantity routing analysis. And there's a significant difference in the run times, the assembly times for the different products. But our weighted average here, even though there's some of these that, that are 20 minutes in terms of assembly, there's such a small percentage, it really doesn't affect the weighted average too much. But again, only 23% of all the products come this way, percentage taking this path. So when all this is distilled down, the operator cycle time, the machine cycle time, the setup time, and the yield, it will distill down into a little value stream map where you can put the inventory that's ahead of this process called assembly. All of this will be distilled down into a simpler format because when you have a weighted average time of 8.3, that's the amount of time we have to allow for the average part that comes to assembly but knowing that only 13.8% of these parts come this way, I got to multiply 8.3 times 13.8, excuse me. And that means I have to allow 1.1 minutes for every part, whether it assembles or not. Excuse me, I got a sore throat today, so I'm drinking some hot water. Um, so that's the operator cycle time, the machine cycle time, the setup time, the yield, all of these, all of these are distilled down, and once you put the value stream map together in this spreadsheet that will give you uh, does that all for you, it'll look like this. Here, here's the the raw data worksheet where you enter the information. You don't really enter the information on the value stream map down here. <clears throat> it's calculated for you. You only have to enter the inventory ahead of each step. We have clients that update this every day. We have clients that run it on a weekly basis and have kind of a lock schedule. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you run it much more uh, infrequently than that, but we have a lot of our clients that are just turning off their MRP uh, systems in terms of daily planning and using this uh, to plan their <clears throat> to plan their staffing on each of their on each of their value streams. So uh, I'll stop in a little bit and see if I answered that question for you. So this. Every one of these process steps is going to get multiplied by the percentage that actually take this path. And you'll see that in the NC saw cut, it's uh, the weighted average time for a piece is 2.1. Well, it's also going to be 2.1. Each, each of these weighted averages is going to get multiplied through this percentage taking this path and become the value added, uh, I guess I should call it value, for each of these process steps. Uh, in this case, 2.1 times 100% is still 2.1, but for the other two steps, it's going to be different. And this is so important in laying out a, a manufacturing cell because if you go out and you time a process and you assume that everything gets this, this step, you're going to have too many people, you're going to have too many machines, you're going to have too much space occupied. We really need to multiply that weighted average time it takes to make a product through the actual percentage that take this path in order to get this weighted average of a weighted average. So this uh, all gets distilled down into a summary, and we're going to blow this summary up for you and take a look at it because this actually tells us on the next page that we need, based on our operator cycle time, this says if I were able to do it, do it all by myself, every unit that goes out the door, there's 6.2 minutes there's 6.2 minutes of labor associated with every unit that goes out the door, and that could be a work unit. Uh, that could be that 
you're making washing machines one day and those birthing beds the next day and vending machines, that could be based on a work unit, not a mass, n not a mass production unit. <clears throat> so here's our operator cycle time, machine cycle time, and setup time on the weighted average, realizing that all of our product is in there. And if I divide that by my hybrid tack time, it tells me I need 1.63 operators in this, little, in this little manufacturing cell. I realize this is a simple example. Um, I'm going to try to get to these questions here. Um, so if you look back at the inventory, it's being multiplied in this red zone by the time it takes to do that step. And when I add up all these red non-value added wait times and divide it by the green value added times, it's going to give me a value added ratio. And that's, that's the number the companies are starting to focus on. Um, th this assumes that not only is, uh, is the product going to be a different level of complexity, but it's going to be a different level of complexity from process to process. So I've worked in the sheet metal industry, and what was, what was easy one day at the turret punch was, you know, and, and difficult at the press break, flip-flop the next day, and what was easy for me to form on the press break was difficult on the punch. So you've got to have a, you've got to have a value stream mapping tool that's flexible so you can actually kind of update it every day if necessary when, when the staffing levels are going to have to be adjusted based on part complexity. So once we know that, that we need one unit, in this case every four minutes, and we need 1.63 operators, uh, we go to the next page of our value stream map, and this is where we assign standard work. So it assumes that everybody's going to have to be working to a four-minute tag time. Well, obviously, if some process takes eight minutes, you're going to have to have two people doing that, uh, every, you know, one person every eight minutes or two people every four minutes. So um, in this case, we just assign stand the saw cutting, and that takes – but let me, just, uh, let me just repeat myself a little bit here. So this is the standard worksheet and where we came from the value stream map with the understanding that we need a little under two people. This is how we could divide the work among three people. And if I wanted to divide the work among three, uh, two instead, I could up their percentages if I could divide the work equally. So um, here's what would happen. Let's say that our numbers go up from 60 to four, uh, and 40 up to 80 and 60, my tack time drops, I need it quicker. Without changing anything else, all I've done is just change these two numbers from 60 to 40 up to 80 and 60. So it went from 116 daily demand to 156. My tack time dropped. All of a sudden, Fran's overloaded. Dan's still underloaded. So it might be better that I split the work between these two Instead of assigning all the work to Fran, I'm going to assign both of them to do that work, and now they're both equally balanced at 68%. Now, obviously, that only makes sense if the NC router is something they can share. But that's how we balance the line to attack time, and everybody in the factory, or at least in this value stream map, is working to that same tack time. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to show you an actual value stream map, I've genericized it here to so keep the anonymity of the company uh, protected. But this is a company uh, that makes uh, silicone products for the aerospace industry. Uh, so gaskets for aircraft doors, windows, rudders, everything that might go into an aircraft. And they make other product too, so it's very diverse. You never know what they're going to get an order for the next day. So here's their current objective statement. They were only about 82% on time. Uh, our objectives here were to get them up to 98% on time, and the distance traveled reduced by 75% and so forth. So we started with the same logic to, get, to determine their tack time. Uh, we flow charted their process. And again, dissimilar from Henry Ford, a lot of their product didn't go through every process. In this case, 30% of it went around, and the, uh, some of this water jet and router processes and went directly to fabrication. So that's, that's a big difference between most uh, value stream mapping systems where we would uh, assume it's assembly line going one direction. So we did a spaghetti diagram, identified that product was traveling through their plant an average of 830 feet per unit. 
we did a value stream map. We timed every single process, and there was a high variety of uh, uh, product in, in this particular value stream. We collected a lot of ideas as we went. We know exactly how much it's costing at each step. Part of that time is value added and part of it is non-value added, but these uh, ideas for extracting the non-value added is uh, what, what we're here to do. So I know this is an eye chart, but it basically shows you they had three value streams uh, running three different product types. We actually posted that on the wall, much like uh, the Learning to See book would uh, recommend that you do this uh, not in a computer, but just do it on butcher paper. I, I believe that their process was so complex, uh, doing it on butcher paper just didn't make sense because when you changed one thing, like uh, the daily demand, it, it changed 40 things downstream, and there was no way a human could keep that all in their head. So a simple Excel spreadsheet uh, can do that much better than a human can try to manage it. So once we have all that in place, um, you can look across the top here, and this is all distilled down, all the value stream map that was associated with that product, and they identified in red everything that was, this is actually backwards, um, everything that was non-value added and uh, what they considered unnecessary, and they, they colored it red. Everything that was value added, they colored green, and everything non-value added but necessary uh, was yellow. So if you look up at the top, it, it looks to me maybe 30%, 25, 30% was value added. So this was a target-rich environment to try to extract waste, primarily these red items. And once we did that, we found out that it, there was 36 minutes worth of labor in every one of these silicone parts that they made. Uh, there was a lot of dwell time or cook time. Uh, they had to put a lot of the silicone into an oven to cure, so there was some machine cycle time there and some setup time. They needed one every minute and, fifth minute and uh, basically 12 seconds. Uh, so if I take the operator cycle time and divide it by the tack time, it says they need 38 people. They're, by the way, their value-added ratio is about 1 to 126, not the worst I've ever seen. So what are those 38 people going to do? Over here in their fabrication department, we needed 13 people doing these three steps. So 13 people were sharing the duties of trimming, sawing, and hand fabricating. There was four people uh, doing the calendaring, which is like mixing the silicone together like a big bread mixing machine. So four people doing that, uh, five people sharing the duties at detooling, which is taking the silicone out of the tool. And so that's the distribution of work at this particular tack time. Uh, their tack time was one minute and change, just, just about 60 seconds per unit. So obviously, there must have been 13 or 14 minutes worth of work to do the hand fab on this because if I need one every, every minute and there's 13 minutes worth of work, I'm going to have to have 13 people doing it. So it's not rocket science, but it is a science. Then once we knew how many people were in this process, we could start identifying how this is going to flow through the manufacturing plant because this was actually a plant layout. So everybody in all three teams shared the calendaring and cutting system, and then it went into what they call GKN and long seals and rudder seals, and then out through shipping. So we played with conceptual flow. There was a sharing of a water jet machine between these two value streams and a sharing of a router between these two value streams. So conceptually, we tried to put this on, onto a whiteboard, and we tried a couple of different iterations of this, and finally started going to what we call a block layout, where it wasn't necessarily to scale yet, but we could map out the flow of the different product families, even within what they called long seals. There was about five or six different sub-families that each had their own tack time. So the next step was to identify all the activities in their uh, value stream and list them on both axes here and we ask ourselves the question how important is the calendaring to the cut line and they said it was absolutely important A 
Some of them are especially important or important, ordinary or unimportant. So the number value here, if it turns, if it's a four, that's absolutely important. It turns red. And anything red we know needs to be close together. So that helps refine and select uh, which alternative they like. They came up with nine. You can see nine alternative layouts. Uh, there were like different layouts versions of this. And of those nine layouts, they selected number three. They said alternative three was the best layout in terms of its cost, in terms of its fostering flow within the cell, in terms of uh, team communication and so forth. Uh, and the next best was alternative six. So our goal was to take the best of three and the best of six and put them together and come up with the best of the best. And that's what they did here. And you can see the, the flow as they uh, represented it here on the, on the PowerPoint presentation. So now their value added ratio went from 126 to 179 and the distance traveled dropped everything got better uh, and they have a what we call a capacity planner also a part of the same spreadsheet so when their when their number of molds changes let's say today from from today to tomorrow it tells them exactly how much whip they need tells them exactly how many what's the ideal number of operators in each team for their new tack time so watch these numbers here these tack time numbers change when I change this number of demand and also the work in process will change so when the, when the number tomorrow drops from from 519 to 445 the number of operators in, in, in the first team goes from 24 to 15 it goes from the second team from from 2 to 5 because that number goes up evidently and on the third team it goes from it stays the same so <clears throat> this becomes a capacity planning tool that is something that's real time and you can actually change it even during the middle of the day so our goal is to be able to move away from a condition where our material comes in from receiving into raw material storage and goes from to one department into a storage rack and then into a different department and back into a storage rack and then maybe through three or four different process steps and into a storage rack. Our goal is to just make a few changes, and this is a, an actual case study that we did up in Yakima, Washington, uh, and just with a few changes, they're able to see at least a portion of their business become lean by using this value stream map. But my recommendation again is you can't value stream map your entire company. You gotta value stream map the value streams, which assumes you know what your value streams are. And the best way I've gotten at finding that answer quickly is to say, if you were forced to move from your current building into three separate buildings, how would you divide the work? That probably gets at what are your value streams quicker than anything. <clears throat> so, you know, this is a quick overview. I realize that it's probably like getting a drink from a fire hose, but we can give you more in-depth uh, experience with this and I'm going to actually give you examples this is the wood shop example <laughs> that I went through where all the work, uh, worksheets on this value stream map are there for you to play with uh, you can change the percentage uh, by just changing the quantity here you can say instead of 80 I want 50 and I want 30 and what does that do to my tack time what does that do my staffing right here I'll just turn this yellow for a second watch that number change if I need 1.4 operators in this condition if my demand goes up to 120 a day and I need 60 a day of this and I'm not making any of this today I need to know immediately what that does to my staffing and here here we go it's instead of 1.4 it's 1.6 and if I do need some assembly work which is the most complex it's going to tell me immediately how much more people I need and where on the standard worksheet they're overloaded. These numbers will become red the minute they go to 85%. So I can play what if. I can say what if I give this to two people and I give this to one person. I can see the immediate impact and be able to plan my capacities and I'll know how much work in process there should be in my value stream 
Now this is a very obviously a very simple example. I'm going to also make this available to you on our website. So I will give you uh, anybody that wants a copy a copy of a value stream map that they can play with uh, and actually put your numbers into. Um, we want to make these webinars valuable for you, and I hope that they have been. I appreciate your comments. If you want to chime in with a little chat to tell us how we can make them better, I really appreciate that. Um, what future webinars would you like to see? I mean, we can go over some case studies. We can talk about Lean for the Office or Plant Layout. Uh, we can even get into some Six Sigma, and we've got a class coming up uh, in, in regard to exporting. Uh, we've got ex experts on our team that can help you uh, realize how you can have business growth uh, through uh, reaching out to other markets. Take the next few weeks and ask yourself, how, how can we get started? Uh, how can we uh, perform a lean assessment, develop a strategic plan, and develop the, at least the first model line? Uh, and we're ha happy to help. Uh, we, we are, uh, I'm going to go ahead and make an offer here. I hope my director is okay with this, uh, to make a free visit to your organization uh, and pay you a visit and give you a lean assessment. And by the end of that little, little visit, you'll know roughly what your value added ratio is, something that your customers someday are, are probably going to start asking you, what's your value added ratio? Because it's a great indicator of how effective you are uh, and how close to world class you are operating. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions, comments, uh, concerns,